Hello and good morning students. Welcome to the e-learning program initiated by Shri Gyanandri Vidyapeet for the students of Standard 9th. Once again, nice to see you in today's English Literature Lecture. In today's lecture, we will be looking into an important grammar topic that is figures of speech. Well, in the last lecture, we had initiated and concluded the poem Road Not Taken. We understood the lines of the poem quite well. We understood the literal and the non-literal that is the figurative meaning of the entire poem. So, it would be nice to look into the figures of speech that come across in that particular poem. But before we discuss the figures of speech that the poet has used in the construction of his poem, in the stanzas, as a general idea we should understand first of all what figure of speech is along with some figures of speech that are commonly used by people to beautify the language. Well, in the earlier class also you learned about figures of speech. So as a part of recapitulation, it is important to understand the word figure of speech in the very first place. Well, there are more than 100 figures of speech or known figures of speech I would be saying. But it is less important to learn and remember all of these. Out of these 100 known figures of speech, we should be remembering some 15 to 20 popular or most commonly used figures of speech. That would be enough for us. So as a part of learning figures of speech, the first question that needs to be answered is what are figures of speech? So to answer this question, have a look at your screen, the image being displayed to you. A figure of speech is a deviation from the ordinary use of words in order to increase their effectiveness. So what is the meaning of this first line? A figure of speech is a deviation. You say something which is apart from the actual meaning that you are trying to say. You are not trying to say the literal meaning. You are using the words but you mean something else. So that is the use of figure of speech or that is what is figures of speech. Well, basically it is, it is a figurative language that may consist of a single word or a phrase. It may be a simile, a metaphor, a personification to convey the meaning other than the literal meaning. It means the poet is using some words but he does not mean what he is using. He wants to convey a different meaning, just like the poem that we read in the last lecture, The Road Not Taken. And earlier also we learned that the road not taken does not exactly mean or in the physical sense mean the road, but we mean to say the decisions that we have not or the opportunities or the decisions that we have left out, we have not taken, isn't it? That is what we understood in the non-literal figurative meaning of the explanation of the poem. Well, further I can add to this, a figure of speech is a creation of a special effect by the poet to draw the attention of the reader. So, the poet wants to draw our attention towards what he wants to convey, what he wants to say. Therefore, he uses a figurative language, a decorative and ornamental language in order to convey the well, as I said, there are more than 100 known figures of speech. Well, we are not going to go through all these 100 figures of speech, but we will go through some most common figures of speech that probably we have learned in the earlier class, as well as we will add a few more that we will have to learn this year. So, have a look at your screen, the image being displayed, the next image being displayed to you. Some common figures of speech that we came across last year as well with some examples given to you. First one is simile. A direct comparison is made between two unlike objects which have at least one common point. Words 
like or as are used for comparison. In simile, two unlike things are explicitly compared. For example, she is like a fairy. A simile is introduced by words like words such as like, so, as, etc. So these are the words that we make use when we compare two things and when we compare things with the help of these words we say that a simile has been used in order to beautify the language or to make a comparison. The next commonly used figure of speech is metaphor. Implied simile. Metaphor in other words if I say is implied simile. Indirect comparison between two unlike objects where comparison is taken for granted. So we take it for granted that one thing is just the same as the other. It is an informal or implied simile in which words like, as, so are omitted. We don't make use of these words. For example, he is like a lion is a simile and if I say he is a lion well he is not actually a lion but when I am making a comparison between a person who has brave qualities like a lion and I am omitting the word like and I simply say he is a lion he is a lion of our team therefore I am conferring someone I am felicitating someone with those qualities of a well, have a look at these examples. She is a star of our family. So, do we literally mean to say someone is a star? No, he is still a human being. But we have made a comparison by saying that a person is having the quality of a star. Star has the quality of shining, being bright. So, he is a very bright person of our family. The childhood of the world. The anger of the tempest, the deceitfulness of the riches, wine is a mocker, she is now in the sunset of her days. You see all these examples are metaphors, where comparison is made by using an implied simile. The next commonly used is personification. Personification is an attribution of personal nature, intelligence or character to inanimate objects or abstract notations. Well, to simplify this, I can simply say that when things are compared by giving them qualities of having life, when inanimate objects, that is lifeless objects, are considered to have life within them, we say a personification has been used. For example, in some phrases we use the furious storm. Well, furious? How can a storm be furious? We are giving storm, which is a non-living thing, a sense of life inside it. We are bringing life to storm over here. The thirsty ground. Can a ground ever be thirsty? No, ground is a non-living thing. But we are saying the thirsty ground because when it starts raining after the scorching heat of the summers, it absorbs, it drinks a lot of water, isn't it? The very first uh, pour of the rain, shower of the rains, the rain season, what happens? All the water is sucked and absorbed. And we consider, we say that the ground is very thirsty. See, the thirsty ground. Well, we don't mean to say the ground is thirsty in literal sense, but it is a figurative way of saying as if the ground is very thirsty. So here we are giving ground a personified, a personal, a personal look over here. We are giving it a life into it. Well, therefore, thirsty ground. The pitiless cold. Now, cold does not have pity on someone, isn't it? But we say pitiless cold. This cold is not having pity on anyone. It is just troubling everyone. Well, little sorrows sick and weep. Do sorrows weep? Do sorrows have life? But we say so. Little sorrows sit and weep. It is we who weep. Well, the dish ran away from the spoon. Well, can a dish run away? We are here trying to say as if 
the dish acquired some uh, qualities of life as it is running away from the spoon it is going away from the spoon so you see these are a few examples of personification where lifeless things are shown to have life <clears throat> next one is metonymy metonymy is meant for a change of name it is a substitute of the thing names for the thing meant well having looked the example we will be able to understand it better the pen is mightier than the sword now we are using over here pen and sword over here now we don't literally mean to say the pen over here the pen is mightier than the sword so what are we doing we are meaning to say a substitute for the same names over here pen and sword from the cradle to the grave from the childhood to the death so we don't literally mean to say cradle or the thing in which you sleep when you were a child your childhood is being referred when the word cradle is being meant over here so that is what we want to understand it. similarly in the previous one where we said the pen is mightier than sword we don't literally mean to say that we are comparing a sword and a pen well if you literally take the sense a pen would be weaker than a sword isn't it if i take a sword and chop a pen it would be chopped down to pieces so i would be saying that sword is sharper than a pen or if i take a pen and hit it on a sword what will happen will the sword break no the pen will break actually here we don't literally mean to say by saying that pen is mightier than the sword we mean to say the power of words are more than the powers of something physical damage done to someone if you happen to hurt someone physically it would be once but if you hurt someone by saying something wrong or by telling something uh, that can abuse him or that can hurt him that would that hurt would stay in his life forever so therefore it is said pen is mightier than the sword similarly from cradle to grave from childhood to death where cradle is being replaced for the word childhood and grave is being replaced for the concept of death therefore we say a metonymy has been used in this sentence i have never read milton now well if you don't read a person how can you read a person isn't it but here you don't mean to say milton here you mean to say the works written by milton the works of milton the books or the literature that is written by milton therefore we say i have never read milton Well, you are not read, literally reading Milton, the person, but the works of Milton you have never read. The next commonly used figure of speech that will be required in ninth standard also is hyperbole. Hyperbole is a statement made emphatic by overstatement. When you exaggerate something, when you say something more than you should be saying, or when you consider something overwhelmingly. we say that we made use of an hyperbole for example virtues as the sand of the shore now what are we saying over here virtues qualities vested in a human being virtues the virtues that you and i possess it is being compared to or being exaggerated as the sands of the shore we when you go to the shore to the sea shore what do you see sand everywhere now can you count that sand no there is lots and lots and lots of sand isn't it now we are saying the quality or the virtues that what has is so much as the sand that you find on a shore now you don't have so many virtues within you yes you have good qualities you got virtues with you but it is not that many that can compare to the entire sand on the shore but that is too much to say but it is being said in order to beautify in order to exaggerate something virtues as the sands of the shore just like there is a lot of sand on the shore that much of virtues a person has within himself that is what is being said in this sentence so it is an overstatement we are overwhelmingly giving importance to virtues over here well the next one irony or sarcasm and in this mode of speech the real meanings of the words used are different from the intended meaning we are not using the same words over here for example the child of cobbler has no shoe well a 
Ravi is trying to say over here. The child of the cobbler, a cobbler is in the business of making shoes. Now we are saying that his own child does not have a shoe to wear. So that is something unacceptable, isn't it? It's an irony, a sarcasm. How could a cobbler's child does not have a shoe to wear? So that is a speech or the real words used over here are different from the meaning. A child of the cobbler has no shoe. Next one, we have epigram. It is a brief pointed saying. It couples words which apparently contradict each other. The language of the epigram is remarkable for its brevity. For example, the child is the father of man. A very famous quote by William Wordsworth. Another one, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Is also an example of an epigram. You can see it is a brief pointed saying where a contradiction can be seen. Fools rush where angels fear to tread. So contradictory ideas have been pre uh, presented over here. The art lies in concealing art. Silence is sometimes more eloquent than words. So silence is one idea and it is being said, silence is sometimes more eloquent, is more important than words. So you see, what is being said over here, silence and words are being uh, used as opposite ideas over here. It's more important, more eloquent. Next we have antithesis. In antithesis, a striking opposition or a contrast of words is made in the same sentence in the order to secure emphasis. Contrasting ideas or opposite ideas or words are used in a sentence to create a poetic effect. As you see in the example, for the caged bird sings of freedom. To err is human, to forgive divine. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. So all these examples are showing contrasting words or opposing ideas. A striking opposition or contrast of words is made, but in the same sentence in order to secure emphasis, importance. The next figure of speech we have is alliteration. In alliteration, there is a repetition of consonant sounds, especially in the beginning of the words. For example, we can print and plow and weave and heat. So you see over here, we can print and plow and weave and heat. So here you find a repetition of the consonant sounds in the sentence. Another example. Glittering through the gloomy, you can see the letter G, the sound of letter G, the consonant sound is being repeated over here. The furrow follows, the sound of F, consonant F is repeated in these sentences. Well, the next we have repetition. Repetition of words and phrases to increase the musical effect of a poem. For example, remember no men are strange, no countries foreign. So, here there is a repetition of words, no and no. Remember no men are strange, no countries foreign. So, the word no is being repeated over here. Therefore, we say it is a repetition used in the construction of this uh, sentence to give it a poetic effect. Next we have the figure of speech oxymoron. Well, it's good to learn this one. Well, you may not be required to use this. It is a figure of speech which combines two seemingly contradictory or incongruous words for sharp emphasis or effect. Two such ideas which would be highly opposite to each other. 
darkness visible now how can darkness be visible to you but yes you see the dark isn't it when you stand in the dark you can see that dark also so darkness visible well visibility is connected with light but you are saying darkness visible make haste slowly now how can one be hasty also and slow also so make haste slowly so do highly opposite ideas are called as oxymoron loving hate well words taken from the romeo and juliet loving hate now how can have to have two things together loving and hate so loving and hate indicate opposite ideas if i say he is an educated illiterate now would you accept this sentence no how can an educated be an illiterate but if i say this in the sentence he is an educated illiterate maybe he has done such an act which illiterate people do so i am saying he is educated illiterate so two opposite ideas expressing an oxymoron next we have an important thing to see is light to this a uh, very commonly used and you will come across this figure of speech when we look into the uh, lines of the poem the road not taken it is the opposite of hyperbole here an affirmative is conveyed by negation or opposite so a uh, affirmative idea is conveyed by the use of a negation or a negative or as you see in the example he is no dullard directly did not say that he is wise he is no dullard so we have used the word no and then we added the quality dullard he is no dullard it means he is intelligent i am not a little it means i am more i am more in quantity i am not little i am much he is not a bad sort he is it means he is a good one but the way it has been presented in the um, affirmative manner using a negation therefore we say it is a lie to this next we have interrogation this is a rhetorical mode of affirming or denying something more strongly than could be done in an ordinary language example who is here so base that would be a bond man who is here so rude that would not be a roman who is here so vile that will not love his country by shakespeare so this is the last sentence which will help you to understand who is here so vile that will not love his country so these examples are interrogation in order to confirm something deny something more strongly next we have is exclamation it is used for expressing a strong feeling well it's very simple to understand exclamation you must have learned our exclamatory sentences as well oh lift me as a wave a leaf a cloud i fall upon the thorns of life i bleed so such a poetic feeling is created when feelings are expressed so this is an example of an exclamation next is tautology one of the most commonly <coughs> used figures of speech in poetry unnecessary use of words or ideas which does not add to the meaning but repeat it is called tautology tautology is meant for repeating the same fact or idea in different words so more than one word is used to express the same thing and we say it is a tautology as you see in this example and the fat worms waiting for a dawn bright light so here you can see the words unnecessary words being used over here and the fat worms waiting for a dawn bright long so the word dawn and bright both mean the same is it it repetition of the word dawn and long dawn and bright over here so the dawn and bright both mean the same the breaking of the light the first light that you see in the morning another example it is the privilege and 
and the birthright of every man to express his ideas without any fear. So here you see privilege and birthright. Two words being repeated over here containing the same meaning. So unnecessary use of words is called tautology. Next one is onomatopoeia. Another important one. You learned about onomatopoeia in class 8 as well. When you learned the literature part, the grammar part, figure of speech part. Onomatopoeia are words creating sound effects. The formation of a word whose sound is made to suggest or echo the sense as in cuckoo, bang, growl, his, boom, bang and many more words could be added. So a sound creating word which actually does not have any meaning when it is used in a sentence to create a sound effect we say it is an onomatopoeic word, onomatopoeia. Well, as you see in the example sentences over here, the moon of doves in memorial elms and murmur of innumerable bees. Now the word murmur over here, moon over here are onomatopoeic words. <clears throat> Rent with the tremendous sound your ears asunder with guns, drums, trumpet, blunderbuss and thunder. So all these words express the onomatopoeic sound effects over here. Onomatopoeic words. Next we have the climax. It is an arrangement of a series of ideas in order to increase importance. Where things happening are put in an increasing order of its importance. As you see in the example, what a piece of work man how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties. So the second sentence was in the higher order of the first one. And the third one, in action, how like an angel. So you see, the first sentence was just describing a man. What a piece of man, what a piece of work man is that God has created. Further again, it is man has been described. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculties. So, two words noble and infinite are giving even more importance to man. Further, the third sentence, in action, how like an angel. Finally, man which is just a man who is not actually an angel has been told to be an angel over here. So, the three sentences have been kept in the order of its increasing importance. And we say such a use of a sentence is called climax. Anticlimax. Anticlimax is just the opposite of climax, which is the decreasing order of its importance. This is the opposite of climax and signifies a ludicrous descent from the higher to the lower. Have a look at the example. He lost his family, his car and his cell phone. So you see, here the three things have been arranged in the less significance importance that is the descending order he lost his family first the most important thing followed by the less lesser important his car and finally the least important is his cell phone so the things have been arranged in a descending order therefore we say this is an anti climax next we have anastrophe anastrophe is a type of syntax inversion that changes the order of a sentence, sentence structure for poetic effect or for giving it an effect. As you see the example, the greatest feature failure is. Now this sentence could be simply written in the manner failure is the greatest feature. Now instead of writing this way, the sentence has been written in a reordered structure. The syntax inversion has taken place over here. The greatest teacher, comma, failure is. So when a sentence which can, could be written in a very simple manner is written in a restructured or restructured uh, order of words, we say that it is an anastrophe. So anastrophe is a type of syntax inversion 
that changes the order of the sentences structure for giving it a poetic effect the next figure of speech sinidaki sinidaki is the understanding of one thing by means of another here a part is used to designate the whole or the vice versa the whole to designate a part so when you talk about a small part and try to represent the whole object or the whole thing we say that it is a synecdoche used in a statement or a sentence for example my bought a new set of wheels now what are we trying to say over here did my buy only wheels does anyone only buy wheels yes we want to change a spare tire or something a different thing we don't mean to say this over here my bought a new set of wheels when you use this way of uh, saying as a synecdoche we mean to say that my bought a new motorcycle a new car so here what is happening the set of wheels which is a part of the vehicle the part of the object representing the whole so when i say my bought a new set of wheel does not mean the wheel it's only it means the vehicle or the object that he has bought it could be a car it could be a motorcycle so a part representing the whole similarly the next example is just the uh, opposite of the first word that is the whole representing a part can you spare your wallet now you are asking someone can you spare your wallet it means can you give me your wallet your wallet must be having money inside it so are you asking someone to give the entire wallet or so the whole thing you are asking can you spare your wallet you don't mean to say that just give me your wallet or spare your wallet do away with it you are asking someone to give you some money can you spare your wallet means by saying the whole thing you are asking some amount that is within your wallet so can you spare your wallet does not indicate the whole thing that you are asking perhaps you are asking some bucks from the some money from the wallet can you spare me some money so you see select the case used in this sense a part representing the whole or the whole representing a part the next is transferred epithet yet another important one that one must learn in transferred epithet the qualifying object is transferred from a person to a thing as in phrases so what happens over here the qualifying object is transferred from a person to a thing it means the action or the performance is done by the person but it is presented to be a thing how let us see the example words like phrases like sleepless night now can a night be sleepless no a night is not sleepless the person who was not able to sleep in the night time is not having good sleep the person who has failed to sleep but still what do we say i had a sleepless night so the night wasn't sleepless so what is happening here the objective the qualifying objective for not getting sleep is being transferred upon the night so sleepless night cruel bars so cruel bar means uh, bars that keep the prisoner inside the jail so cruel bars are the bars cruel no it's the prisoner who has done the criminal activity and now is behind the bars he is cursing the bars cruel bars suicidal sky is the sky suicidal no well so these are a few phrasal examples of transferred epithet we have an example how to use transferred epithet in a sentence as well let us see i had a wonderful day now what is being said over here i had a wonderful day now wonderful day if you concentrate on these two words is the day wonderful really day is an abstract idea is an abstract thing is the day going to be wonderful no it is not the day wonderful the day is not in itself wonderful but the speaker had a wonderful day the one who is saying that i had a wonderful day actually had a wonderful day therefore the epithet wonderful actually describes the kind of day the speaker experienced so you see this is what's happening 
in a transferred epithet. Well, the next and probably the last one that we need to acknowledge is apostrophe. Well, the moment the word apostrophe comes to your mind, the punctuation mark would arise or emerge in your senses. But remember, it is not the punctuation mark that is being discussed over here. We are discussing a figure of speech apostrophe. Well, for that, we can read the note. It is important not to confuse apostrophe, the literary device. We are talking about a literary device, a tool that creates a poetic effect in the lines. So, it is important not to confuse apostrophe, the literary device, with the apostrophe, that is a punctuation mark, as you can see mentioned in the brackets. The rule of the punctuation mark shows possession, isn't it? Belonging to someone. When we use punctuation mark, Raju's, Raman's, Ratan's, Leela's. So we write that punctuation mark over there. In order to show belongingness, that something is being possessed by someone. Or the use of the punctuation mark is the omission of one or more letters, isn't it? Sometimes we write, you will come here. So you, apostrophe, LL. So you will come here to omit the word W over there. So when I write you'll, you will, W-I-L-L. -L. So W and I, the two letters are omitted and then I write as a contraction you. So there are two rules of the punctuation mark, but we are not talking about the apostrophe punctuation in the figure of speech. So what is it? Apostrophe in literature is an arrangement of words addressing a non-existent person or an abstract idea in such a way as if it were present and capable of understanding feelings. So you see how weird it is and how interesting it is. So using apostrophe as a literary device, as a literary tool to express or address someone, to talk to someone, to have a word with someone. Whom are we talking to? non-existence person, the person who is not existing or an abstract idea which is not existing in such a way as if it were present. So we are presenting, this is the beauty of the apostrophe used in a sentence. Well, we have learned about apostrophe way back in the nursery class. You can see the lines, twinkle twinkle little star, how I wonder what you are, up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky. There would be no one who would not be knowing these lines the most popular and beautiful lines of the poem. Well, let's discuss the apostrophe in this. This poem became one of the most popular nursery rhymes told to children, isn't it? Often in the form of a song. In this nursery rhyme, a child speaks to a star. So what is the child doing? He is addressing. He is having a communication, a word with a star. So what is a star? An inanimate object. Is it a living thing? No, it's not a living thing. But he is having a discussion or he is telling to the star, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. So he is talking to him. He is expressing his feeling. So a child speaking to a star. Hence, this is a very classic example of the use of an apostrophe in poem. Well, I hope you understood the 22 important and required figures of speech that we need to learn. Now, after having understood the figures of speech in general, let us now look into the figures of speech that come across in the lines of the poem, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Well, we will discuss these lines in details and try to write the figures of speech. So, make sure that you note this down in your books. The first line of the poem the road not taken, two roads diverged in a yellow road. So think about this line. What is being said over here in this line? Note it down first of all. Two roads diverged in a yellow road. So these lines, two roads driving in a yellow woods, tells us that the poet Robert Frost 
has compared the two roads to something. In the same way, he has compared the yellow book also to something. So what is he comparing it to? So if he is comparing it to, then it would be either simile or metaphor. But it is not a simile. Why is it not a simile? Because he has not made use of the words like like or as or so, isn't it? Therefore, we can say a indirect comparison and indirect comparison is being made over here. So, it's an indirect comparison. You can very well recall that it is a metaphor. In what sense it is a metaphor? Well, the comparison of a wood and a man's life is being made, isn't it? Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. In my life, I came across such a place where I had to make two choices. So, therefore, the two roads indicate the two choices, whereas the yellow wood indicates the man's life. Therefore, I can say that this is a metaphor. Note it down. Well, it is not just a metaphor. Another figure of speech also can be looked upon into this one. We learned about metonymy where a word is replaced for another one. So here you can see, road represents the choices of the life in the poem. So we can say that two roads, the road indicating what? Road is indicating the choices that we make. Therefore, we can say it's a metonymy as. So we have two figures of speech. Note it down. I am sorry, I could not travel both. Have a careful look at this sentence. I am sorry, I could not travel both. Think about the sentence. What comes to your mind? And sorry, I could not travel both. Here, the poet has used a negation. Isn't it? He has used the word could not travel both. He could have simply said, I could travel only one. So, he is saying the words, so he is expressing the idea that because I was just one traveler, I was just one person and sorry, I could not travel both. So he is using a negation, a negative word over here, could not travel, in order to express a positive idea. Therefore, you can very well say that it is litotis, isn't it? Note it down. <clears throat> the next line of the poem, and be one traveller. Long I stood and looked down as far as I could. Well, have a careful observation about this sentence as well. When you read the sentence, immediately it will strike to your mind that you are making use of rhyming word over here, isn't it? And be one traveller long I stood and looked down one as far as I could. So, while saying this, you are using the word stood and could, which creates a Rhyming is a toy here. 
well this rhyme or this rhyming effect is happening within the line therefore i will be saying it is a internal so that's the first figure of speech that we can look into it internal If you observe carefully, you will also find the word one being repeated twice. And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far. So, along with the internal rhyme, we have the repetition of words as well. So, again, you can apply over here. It has got another figure of speech used over here that is repetition. This is how you can identify the figures of speech for the relevant lines. Next one. To where it bent in the undergrowth. Well, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Let's note this down first. Observing this line carefully, we will be able to understand and identify and say that here the road is given a human quality of bending. Can a road bend? Well, human beings can bend if you wish to bend, isn't it? But what is being said? To where it bent in the undergrowth. This it is the road that the poet is talking about. To where the road bent in the undergrowth, along with the bushes over there. Well, the road does not bend. Here it has been personified, that is, a personification has been used over here in the sentence. Therefore, you can easily identify that the road, which is an inanimate thing, a lifeless thing, has been given the human quality of bending. Therefore, you can very well write over here, this is a personification. Next sentence. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim. Then took the other as just as fair. And having perhaps the better claim. Well, observe the sentence carefully. What do we see over here? Here too, you will find that the road is given a human quality of being fair, isn't it? Well, can a road be fair? No, a road is a non-living thing, an inanimate object, a lifeless thing. But the poet has expressed as if it has got life inside it. You can see? Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim. So, here the road being given and uh, a quality of a human quality of being fair. Therefore, we can say the sentence is containing or sentence is a personification. It's personified. Well, along with this, we can also say that what is being told over here? The road was fair and had a better claim. So here the poet has exaggerated. He has given an overstatement to the road over here. Therefore, when something is given overstatement, something is being exaggerated, we can very well recall that it is hyperbole. So 
uh, hyperkali is also used to work. So these are the two. Figures of speech that can be identified from this one. Well, there are a few more. Because it was grassy and wanted well, though as for the passing air, and both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to the way. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, I took the less travelled, and that has made all the difference. So these are some other sentences that I want you to find out the figure of speech for as a part of the homework. So I hope you understood how to find out the figures of speech from a poem quite well, and alternatively you have the understanding. All the figures of speech that you're supposed to learn in class nine. Well, this is all for today's lecture. See you soon in the upcoming lecture. Then take care. Have a nice day. And goodbye.